All right, so now we're going to talk about a few other ways of bending light uh, because so far we've dealt with reflection, which is just reflecting re light, um, refraction, which is bending light. Uh, but there's other ways that we can bend light if we think of it as a wave, right? Because if we have a wave that's going through a small opening, just like this, just like this water wave right here, see this guy's going through this smaller opening, it bends around it, okay? That is called diffraction. So the smaller the opening is, the bigger the wave uh, bends. So here we have a smaller opening, so our wave isn't bending as much, it's just bending a little bit. We make that a bit smaller, it starts bending a lot more. And then we make that really, really small, and it's practically bending all the way around. Okay? So, of course, uh, how much the wave bends depends on the smaller opening. So, smaller opening, greater diffraction. That's what you got to know. Okay, so this is theta. That's just the angle at which it's uh, diffracting. is proportional to 1 divided by L. That's the distance between the gap, right? Another way to have greater diffraction is if the long you have a much longer wavelength compared to the size of the obstacle, then you will have greater diffraction. So here we see that the wavelength is only this big and then the um, opening is that big. So it's not much smaller, so you're not going to get much um, diffraction there. But if you have a much bigger wavelength going through the same size opening, then you're going to have a bigger the fraction. So, for example, radio waves will bend a lot more than visible waves, than ultraviolet, because they are such, they're so much bigger. They're much, much bigger waves. Okay? Uh, microscopes, they work really well uh, with visible light, but you try shining something else through there and you can't. Okay? So we have something like electron scanning microscopes which actually have really, really small waves, so the opening has to be microscopic. Dolphins actually use this in their echolocation, um, and they use radio waves and the bending of them uh, outside of their snout. No, not their snout. What do you call that? Blowhole? Whatever. Uh, <laughs> and they use uh, radio waves in order to send signals to, to one another. And then, of course, when they're sending those signals, uh, then they can make them reach farther because they're bending it through a smaller opening. All right, so let's talk about just a few things that we know about light since it is a wave. Uh, we can polarize light. What does that mean? Polarizing light just means that you align the vibrations. Okay, so either vertically, horizontally, or just in one direction, right? Because... Light can come out in a bunch of different ways. And so if we polarize it, we only want one direction of wave. Okay, so here's our pick and fence analogy. It isn't actually perfect, but it is an all right example to at least start um, visualizing what polarization is. Okay, so in this first one, if I have two picket fences that are both vertical, right here we see they're both vertical. Um, then the wave can go through vertically here and then also vertically through here. Um, but this is going to then get rid of all other types of waves. It's not going to be able to go through because it's only letting the vertical waves go through. Now, if we align them differently, if I align one of them vertically and one of them horizontally, well, only the vertical waves are going to get through here. And since there's no more horizontal ones to go through here then there's just gonna, not going to be any light coming out on the other end because you've completely gotten rid of all the horizontal and vertical. Um, or you've just completely gotten rid of all the wavelengths, right? Because the first one's letting th through vertical wavelengths, and then since the second one doesn't let through vertical wavelengths, only horizontal, there's no more wavelength of light to let through. So, of course, just one single vibrating electron is going to let emit an electromagnetic wave that's polarized. It's going to emit an electromagnetic wave that's oscillating in one direction. But of course, how often do you have just one single vibrating 
electron. You don't. Uh, anything that really gives off light, lamp, flames, sun, they're all going to emit non-polarized light because, of course, you have vibrating electrons and they're vibrating in all different sorts of ways. Uh, so they are producing waves in random directions. So that is actually why the sun's light can be very uh, destructive to our eyes. Our eyes like polarized light a lot better and they find it a lot easier to take in. So that's why we have things called polarized sunglasses. So your sunglasses, what they're doing is they're only letting in one wavelength of light and therefore it felt out all the other ones of the other direction and it's easier on your eyes, which is why you should always get polarized sunglasses because uh, yeah, they're a lot better for your eyes. So that's one very good use of polarization that we have. Another kind of cool, oh, here's an example, another example of polarization, right? So here's your flashlight and the lamp is letting out um, light in all of these different directions, okay? So say we just want uh, the vertical component. So again, we have this polarized sheet here and it only lets through the vertical light, okay? And of course, the second one is then it just takes care of any the first one may have missed. And so then it's all just vertical. Of course, we can completely block the light again by having a vertical and a horizontal, okay? So another uh, way that this was used, actually a really cool way that polarization is used is in uh, 3D glasses that you watch 3D movies with. Um, okay, so, uh, when they first invented them, they made it so one had polarized light that could only go vertically, and one had polarized light that would only let in the horizontal light, and then, of course, your two eyes take that and impose those on each other. Oops. So, of course, your, uh, your eyes take that, impose them on each other, and they give you a three-dimensional image. The bad thing about this is that you would have to keep your head totally and completely straight the entire movie, which um, is kind of difficult. And if you didn't, then you just wouldn't see anything anymore. So this, of course, had to eventually go away. And so what they've actually been able to do in modern 3D glasses is find a way to polarize the light. So this one will only let through clockwise uh, light. And this one will only let through counterclockwise. Um, now, if you ask me how they did that, I have no clue. So, yeah, don't ask. But still, pretty cool um, that they've been managed to do that. And that's how uh, 3D glasses work, which I think is pretty darn cool. So uh, that is another use of polarized light. So there we go. So this is just a little bit of review from Physics 20. We did go over interference, and that's what happens when two waves meet each other. So there we were usually talking about sound waves or matter waves, and now we're talking about what happens with light waves. But of course we know that something happens to light when they overlap. When they pass through the same region at the same time, they do overlap in different ways. So this is the principle of superposition. Resultant displacement of two or more waves will be the algebraic sum of their separate displacement. So basically, if you have two crests meeting each other, the new crest created is just going to be um, the sum of both of those amplitudes of those, those um, waves. And of course, if you have crest meeting a trough, then it could cancel it out. Right, so, uh, but that's the most important to know. Crest is positive, trough is negative. And so, of course, constructive interference is when two crests meets, meet each other, right? So crest meets crest, and then their amplitudes combined. Okay, so in this case, say the amplitudes are exactly the same. So we have two amplitudes of X, and then when they run into each other, they create a much bigger wave that is now 2x, right? It's two times as much because we have two amplitudes of x, and then they just keep going on their merry way away from each other, right? So at first they're moving towards each other, they superimpose, and then they move away from each other. 
And of course, we had destructive interference, and that is when you have two waves um, of the same amplitude, but one's positive and one's negative. Well, of course, we have x here and we have negative x here, so x plus negative x is zero. So when they meet, they will destructively interfere. There will not be a wave at all. And then, of course, they'll keep moving on in their merry ways. Uh, and then you'll have a positive and negative wave again afterwards. Okay, so those are considered out of phase. That is all review from Physics 20. So if you didn't remember that, hopefully you do now. Now what's happening most of the time is just partially destructive interference. Okay, so that means that you just, you don't always have amplitudes that are exactly the same. And so you just have some destructive interference, but not total um, interference. Okay, so when we're talking about that with light, if we can um, constructively interfere light, then you have much brighter light. Um, destructively interfere light, then you have light that cancels out. So this is, well, okay, I'm going to go over my next thing and you can see what's happening with constructive and destructive interference. And we're actually going to see how this applies to light a lot more in the next few lessons. So really important to keep this in mind, what constructive and destructive interference is, because uh, this is the principle that's going to govern our next few Okay, so to de demonstrate just how important it is that we do consider light traveling as a wave and the idea of constructive and destructive interference, I'm just going to tell you a little story. Uh, so in the early 1800s, the French Academy uh, decided to have a friendly competition. French Academy, there was a British Academy. These were just like scientific academies for rich people who had the time and money to um, study science. So, uh, scientists noted when light traveled from one medium to another, it bent. So this was a big thing. They were like, why does it bend? What is it doing? Um, and so they could measure the bending of how this light is, but they didn't know what was actually causing it. They didn't know why it was bending. Um, so there's these two scientists that were at this competition, uh, Poisson and Fresnel, and uh, they got together, they had this debate so Fresnel was all about uh, light being emitted in waves, okay? That was his theory. Poisson was like, that's stupid. Uh, I'm pretty sure that light travels in a series of particles. Uh, and so def they debated about this for a while. Towards the end of the debate, Poisson came up with this argument that seemed to burn Fresnel's theory to the ground. So he was like, um, this is ridiculous because say somebody is being pelted with objects. Um, if you just hide be some, b behind something that's bigger, then, um, then the objects aren't going to hurt you, right? They're going to just fly right by or hit the bigger object and you're going to be fine, right? So if you want to hide from light, you just like hide behind a really big object that blocks the light because then you're in its shadow. Uh, if on the other hand, you're like waist deep in water, then you want to, and you want to hide from a wave, you can't because the wave is just going to go around the bigger thing. So, and then of course light doesn't do that. It doesn't go around, does it? Which now I'm thinking about it. I don't think Poisson was that smart. Like, yeah, light does that. Like. You're still in the shadow, but you're not completely devoid of all... Anyways, so, uh, Poisson was, like, sarcastically mocking Fresnel, and it was like, well, if light was a wave, then, uh, when light is turned on a perfectly spherical object, like, think of that because it's, like, so nice and symmetrical and perfect in every single way. Um, so if I shine light on a perfectly spherical object, then the light would bend around and it would constructively interfere right in the center of the shadow of the sphere, right? Because all light waves would just meet in the exact center and that's where we'd have constructive interference. So there would be this bright spot in the, in the shadow of the sphere. And that doesn't happen, that's stupid. So haha. -ha. You know, so funny. Clearly preposterous. That doesn't happen. Um, so, you know, and so all the French mathematicians and scientists laughed and they, you know, went to lunch or something. 
Um, but this one, the one nerd stayed behind. He was actually a judge in the competition. And he was like, hey, Poisson just like kind of explained a perfect experiment. And are we so sure that we don't see a bright light at the, at the center of that shadow? So he did the experiment. He stayed behind. He found a round object, like a perfectly spherical object, light. And uh, then shone the light on the perfectly spherical object, looked at the shadow behind it, and of course, guess what there was? A perfect bright spot right in the middle. Right where Poisson said it would be. So of course, nothing left to do but award the prize to Fresno, because he was right. Like, this guy just proved, yeah, light is actually a wave. Um, and there we go. So Poisson had put forward this consequence that was so ridiculous uh, and unlikely that it could be explained by anything else. So therefore, when it did happen, it couldn't be explained by anything else other than the fact that light is a wave. So Fresnel, smart enough to come up with a theory, Poisson was smart enough to prove Fresnel right and himself wrong, which is still pretty funny. Um, so yes, this Arago guy actually did the test, but again, he was one of the judges, so he didn't get the prize. And he just did what Poisson basically told him. So, but since this is just like so ridiculous and so on the nose, that bright spot now is forever dubbed Poisson's spot. <laughs> so, uh, it's literally named after him because he was stupid enough to uh, not realize that, yeah, light does constructively and destructively interfere. And so, of course, this is the setup that um, Arago came up with, where he had a light source, he had the sphere spherical object, uh, which, of course, will cast a circular shadow, and then, of course, you have the screen at the back, and you'll see the circular uh, shadow, but with one little bright spot in the middle, and that is called Poisson's spot. So that is an example of constructive interference, um, and don't worry, we will be going over a lot more examples of constructive and destructive interference with light. Just one more note though, keep in mind, maybe Poisson wasn't actually that stupid, because light actually can also travel as a particle. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you all this evidence that light travels as a wave, and that's all we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this unit. Um, but maybe Poisson wasn't so stupid because light can actually also act like a particle, but that discovery was still over 100 years away. So Poisson never really got to like revel in the fact that he actually was right, but his argument was all wrong. There you go. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will talk more about interference tomorrow, uh, but I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Talk to you later.